it's hard to imagine Italy as anything other than the heart of the Latin world, the origin point of Roman civilization which has so greatly influenced the society we live in today. However, it was not always this way. Stretching from the Po Valley to the Tiber River, the Etruscan civilization thrived for centuries before the founding of Rome, boasting a society that rivaled the sophistication of classical Greece, the trading acumen of Phoenicia, and the wealth of Egypt. In this video, we will tell you the story of Italy's most ancient people, and explore the monumental cultural impact they had on the young Roman Republic, and through them, the world. Shout out to Blinkist for sponsoring this video. We live in a fast-paced world and often it's difficult to find the time to learn new stuff. Our work and social life take up most of our time, while social media is addictive, so it's natural to think that you don't have enough time to read a book, yet developing yourself is crucial for every facet of our lives. So how to fix that? We recommend the app called Blinkist. This is a unique app that takes the most important insights, new developments and know-how from thousands of non-fiction books, condensing them into 15-minute long reads or listens. As we have to work almost 24-7 to produce our videos, Blinkist is essential for our personal growth. Recently we've used Blinkist to read Yuval Noah Harari's 21 Lessons for the 21st Century and Mary Beard's Civilizations, and we highly recommend these books to our viewers. The first 100 people to go to Blinkist.com slash Kings and Generals are going to get unlimited access for one week to try it out. You'll also get 25% off if you want the full membership. In their early history, the Romans referred to these strange and foreign peoples to their north as Etruski, and it is from this root that the modern region of Tuscany gained its name. However, the peoples in question called themselves the Racena. At their peak, which lasted from around 750 to 400 BCE, they were an incredibly prosperous society, and their cities lit up the Italian heartland. Pisa, Bologna, Capua, and other modern population centers were originally founded by the Etruscans. They were also a seagoing people, forging trade networks all over the Mediterranean that brought copious wealth into their lands. Through their skilled warriors, they would establish themselves as the premier power in the Italian peninsula for centuries, and although they would eventually be conquered and assimilated into Rome, the empire we all know would be nigh unrecognizable if not for the contributions that the Etruscans made to its society. Where the Etruscans originally came from is a matter of scholarly debate. The ancient historian Herodotus claimed that they were migrants from Anatolia, while others asserted that they were one of the mysterious sea peoples that caused the Bronze Age collapse. It is through language that we gain a clearer window into the Etruscans' past. For most of their history, their civilization was surrounded by Celtic Gauls to the north, Greeks to the south, and Italic tribes to their east, the latter of whom would eventually spawn the Latins of Rome. Diverse as they were, these three people had one thing in common – they spoke Indo-European languages. Today, this massive language family covers most of the globe, but in the early Iron Age, it would have been a relatively new arrival in Europe, with the Greeks, Italics and Celts all being descended from a common ancestor that likely migrated out of the Caucasian mountains between the 3rd to 1st millennium BC. The Etruscan language, however, is not Indo-European, making it an anomaly compared to its neighbours. From this, we can discern that the Etruscans themselves were probably indigenous, belonging to an ancient bloodline that inhabited Europe long before the Great Migration, potentially making them Italy's earliest known people. Whatever their origin may be, we can trace the Etruscans' archaeological presence in Italy as far back as 1200 BC, around the same time the Trojan War supposedly took place. Little is known about Etruscan society this far back in time, but we can be fairly certain that with weapons forged from bronze, they came to dominate central western Italy. They built their villages on naturally defensible plateaus, constructing houses of thatch and mud while subsisting off farming, herding and forestry. They cremated their dead in primitive burial sites, and placed their ashes in Biconic urns. 
1000 BC saw the first Italic peoples enter into the peninsula, but the forebears of the Romans had centuries before their time in the sun would come, and the Proto-Etruscans retained their territorial and cultural integrity in the face of this migration. By the 9th century, the Etruscans entered what is known as the Villanovan phase of their history. Ancient Tuscany was abundant in natural resources, and the Etruscans grew prosperous, mining the abundant copper and iron deposits in their lands. Small hill villages began coalescing into larger towns, and population centers like Veii, Tarquinia and Volci became regional powers. Their society became noticeably more complex, as observed through their architecture, which now featured ornately decorated homes bearing geometric and animalistic motifs. Villanovan Etruscans interred their dead in dedicated necropolises, the richest of which were home to graves bearing ritualistically elaborate weapons, shields and armour made of bronze and iron. These graves also featured luxury goods manufactured in Phoenicia and Greece, indicating that it was around this time that the Etruscans took to the seas, establishing trade networks with the Near East. Etruscan merchants brought back more than just physical treasures from their new trading partners. The period of history between 750 to 500 BC saw them heavily influenced by Eastern, predominantly Greek, cultures. Etruscan pottery, sculpture and art took on a distinctively Eastern style, while the Etruscan elites adapted courtly rituals that emphasized pomp and ceremony, especially rites involving wine, a drink they adored. Most importantly, they opted for the Western Greek alphabet as their writing system, through which we retain the only documentation of their mysterious language today. This era also presided over rapid urbanization of Etruscan society, as their towns bloomed into cities, complete with paved roads and aqueducts, built amongst hallowed tombs, austere temples and luxury villas inspired by Hellenic design. As their tribal warriors evolved into professional armies, the Etruscans expanded their territory, coming to dominate their southern Latin neighbours, including a certain little backwater town called Rome. Politically, the Etruscans were always a divided people. Much like the ancient Greeks, the city-state was the main political unit in Etruria, with a single city forming a nucleus of control over its surrounding rural territory. The cities were often in fierce competition with one another, and war between them was not uncommon. With that said, a loose alliance was formed around 600 BC that consisted of the 12 most powerful city-states, called the League of Twelve Peoples. While this enabled the Etruscans to regulate each other's economic and religious interests, each city remained largely independent in practice. Originally, the city-states were ruled by kings, but like Athens before them, it seems that the Etruscans overthrew their monarchs between the 5th and 4th centuries BC and established a form of oligarchic republican government, although this transition was not uniform across all their cities. Etruscan religion and mythology were rich and multi-layered. Prior to 600 BC, they worshipped formless gods thematically centered around the moon and the sun. As their cultural contact with the Greeks grew deeper, their deities began to more closely resemble the Olympian pantheon. The Greeks saw Etruscan gods merely as adaptations of their own, divine plagiarism the Romans would also later be guilty of. While the Etruscan religion greatly resembled the Greeks, and to a lesser extent the Phoenicians, fundamentally it was unique. Their chief god was Tinia, ruler of the sky. At surface level, he appeared to mirror Zeus, but the two were not entirely parallel. Zeus, like most of the Greek gods, often acted impulsively and violently. Tinia, on the other hand, could not even throw a lightning bolt without permission from a mysterious collective of deities known as the Secret Gods of Favor. Uni, the goddess of fertility and childbirth, was often compared to Hera. But while Hera was the jealous and vengeful wife to a pathologically adulterous husband, Tinia and Uni appears to have a functional, loving marriage. Menever was the third most important deity, 
and was roughly equivalent to Athena. It was from Minerva that the Romans would get the name for their own goddess of wisdom, Minerva. Unlike her Greek and Roman counterparts, the Etruscan Minerva was not a virgin and even had an intimate relationship with the Etruscan version of Heracles. Of course, there were many other gods, some born of the Etruscans' indigenous past and some cut from Greco-Roman cloth. In general, Etruscan gods were more restrained, peaceful, and all-round functional when compared to their Greek counterparts. In most societies, religion is often tied to public spectacle, and in this, the Etruscans were no different. Sporting events, in particular, were incredibly popular, with boxing, wrestling, and chariot racing never failing to draw a crowd. Once a year, citizens of the Twelve Cities would gather at Phanum Voltumne, the most sacred sanctuary in Etruria, and broad parallel to what Mount Olympus was to the Greeks. There they would revel in public games, intertwined seamlessly with intricate religious rituals. If an ancient Greek or Roman happened to attend the games at Phanum Voltumne, they may have been surprised to find women present in the audience. Indeed, Etruscan women enjoyed a great deal of freedom and autonomy compared to their Greco-Roman counterparts, and later Roman authors often condemned them as frivolous, spoiled and depraved when compared to Latin women. The wives and daughters of Etruria had the freedom to own, inherit and transfer property as they saw fit. During ceremonial banquets, they feasted alongside men as equals. For them, there was no shame in drinking, in contrast to Greek women who were generally expected to forgo alcohol. Etruscan women were also prominent leaders in religious life, serving as oracles and priestesses who held direct sway over the people's political decisions through their powers of divination. While the Greeks also had a prominent female sibyl in Delphi, she required male priests to interpret her will, while Etruscan priestesses delivered their own prophecies. The Etruscan cities maintained a strong martial culture, both to settle disputes among themselves and to expand their frontiers against their Gallic and Italic neighbours. Etrurian warfare was originally small-scale in nature. In the Villanovan era, warriors formed the aristocratic elite of society. They armoured themselves with bronze helmets and cuirasses, and went into battle wielding iron spears, javelins, stabbing swords and shields. In general, the rich fought on horseback or on a chariot, while the lower classes fought on foot. Conflicts usually took the form of minor skirmishes between neighbouring tribes, and featured little in the way of tactics. Two armies would meet and exchange a hail of javelins, at which point both sides would charge one another and engage in a chaotic melee. Individual heroism was valued over unit cohesion, and it was not uncommon for warriors to seek one-on-one -on -one combat during the heat of battle. As Etruscan society evolved, so did its military. As a byproduct of trading with the Greeks, the Etruscans slowly adopted a distinctly Hellenic style of arms, armour and warfare. The warrior caste still comprised the social elite, but by the 6th century BC, it had evolved to resemble a Greek hoplite in arms and armour. More disciplined than their Villanovan ancestors, the Etruscan hoplites fought primarily in a phalanx, protected on the wings by cavalry, a universally effective formation that even the Romans used before the adoption of the maniple. Etruscan phalanxes were often supplemented by auxiliaries from their society's lower classes, who were more lightly armed than their aristocratic counterparts, often wielding nothing more than stones and slings. These armies were effective, so much so that with them, the Etruscans expanded their power over the lion's share of Italy. However, like all civilizations, their prosperity would not last forever, and a decline was soon to come. To anyone with a passing knowledge of ancient history, the fall of Etruria to the Romans seems an inevitability, but to the ancients the result was hardly set in stone. Rome itself was founded in 753 BC, and for centuries the urbanized Etruscans considered it a rural backwater barely worth mentioning. This changed in 616 BC, 
when an Etruscan aristocrat from Tarquinia ascended as king of Rome. Known to his people as Lucius Tarquinius Priscus, he introduced his city to a working sewage system, led Rome in its subjugation of the other tribes of Latium, and built the Circus Maximus, importing athletes and chariot racers from Etruria to introduce the Romans to the joy of public sporting. Priscus's dynasty would last two more generations. In 509 BC, his grandson Tarquinius Superbus, infamous for his wanton tyranny, was overthrown and exiled forever, ending the Roman Kingdom and giving rise to the Roman Republic. This marked a turning point in Italian history, as the Romans began to slowly expand, while the Etruscans slowly declined. In 396 BC, after a century of frontier warfare, the dictator Marcus Furius Camillus conquered, sacked, and completely depopulated the city of Veii. The other Etruscan cities looked upon this destruction with apathy. To many of them, Veii was a bitter rival that they were glad to see gone, and besides, it was one thing for Rome to take a city directly on its border, but the upstart Latins could never extend further north into the Etrurian heartland. Naturally, this was a fatal judgement. Hampered by their inability to properly unite against a common enemy, the Etruscan city-states were simply unable to provide a consistent answer to the dynamic Roman military. Over the next few centuries, their territory fell chunk by chunk into Roman hands. One final pushback was made in 298 BC, when the Etruscans finally put up a united front against the Romans, allying with a confederation of Gauls and Samnites in the Third Samnite War. Nevertheless, they were defeated, and this ended any hope of Etruria retaining its independence. Its last city, Volsinii, fell to Rome in 264 BC, the same year that the Republic would go to war with Carthage for the first time. Even after their conquest, the Etruscans did not disappear overnight. Their people, culture and language survived for another 300 years under Roman rule. However, following the Social War of 90 BC, Etruscan cities within the Republic gained full Roman citizenship, and this expedited their assimilation into Latin society, and by around 30 AD, the Etruscan language had gone extinct, ending a culture that had endured for nearly 1,500 years. Nevertheless, the legacy these ancient peoples left upon the Roman Empire was nothing short of extraordinary. The Romans based their Latin alphabet upon Greek letters but they received those letters through the Etruscans. Core pillars of Roman infrastructure, such as the aqueduct and the paved road, were cultural borrowings taken from well-established Etruscan technology. Icons of Roman authority, such as the toga, the fasces, and the custom of the military triumph were all originally Etruscan. The Romans adopted much of Etruscan military technology, such as the use of brass trumpets to relay orders in battle. Even the iconic Pelum and Scutum evolved from Etruscan designs. By and large, the Romans owed much of their skill in metalworking to the master artisans of Etruria. Finally, the Roman love for public sports and spectacle was rooted in Etruscan culture. Some sources even claim that the institution of gladiatorial combat evolved out of an Etruscan sacrificial rite. One must imagine Emperor Justinian watching his beloved greens turn a corner in front of an electric crowd of 40,000 people in the Constantinople Hippodrome, and wonder if he knew that he owed this spectacle to a forgotten people gone 600 years before his birth. Indeed, it is easy to ascribe the value of the Etruscans solely upon the cultural legacy they left upon an empire that, in turn, has left such a profound legacy on our society today. However, these mysterious peoples of a bygone Italy are more than a stepping stone of Roman history. Their society stands on its own as one of the strongest, wealthiest, and most sophisticated of antiquity and a reminder of the fascinating worlds one can find by digging deep into the mysterious mists of humanity's forgotten past.
We always have more stories to tell, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.